have our very own Toby, who, if I remember right, is going to tell us something about uh, categories by proxy in the pair of construction. Yeah, that's great. OK, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, so I know we've had all a long and exciting day. So I thought the best thing to do would be to have like definition, theorem, proof, and just questions at the end. So without further ado, categories. OK. I don't know what I mean by that. But the thing I do know is that there are these things called categories that are parameterized, para construction sometimes called. So if C is a monoidal category, we can make another monoidal category C, where the morphisms are somehow equipped with a parameter object on their domain. Right, so what does that mean? It means that we have, say C has products, and the monoidal structure is the product. It means if we have a you know, morphism A to B, then in para C, it'll be some choice of P anamorphism p times a to b. Now, in these, this is written like something like this, a to b with a p over it. Now, I don't, I don't like this thing for some reason. The reason is that this kind of para category somehow doesn't have enough limits, or it doesn't have enough objects for me to talk about limits properly. I want to be able to use like the internal language of C to make statements about things that, are, that come with parameters. And I think that if we sort of take a different kind of perspective, a perspective which I'll explain, and perspective of power and perspective of this thing called a category, categories by proxy is something that I'll sort of come to give in more detail, um, we can sort of maybe, for my purposes, do a little bit better. But before we get onto that, I wanted to say a little bit more about the motivation. So I'm going to erase this. I've said a little bit about what I mean by this para C thing. But I really come from a place where I'm thinking about systems that predict the world and that kind of maybe do so in a way there's some uncertainty. And often the way this is done is by having some kind of map like A to B. Um, and I'm going to draw a dot to say this is a kind of special arrow. It's a special arrow because really, think of this as like, you know, this A to B is like a function. This is going to be a function where I've got some uncertainty about B. And so usually what we, what we say is that there's some, some functor on C that gives me, say, distributions over the objects. So that say these are states, this functor d c to c would say take an object and give me the object whose points are like finitely supported probability, probability distributions over the set, I don't know, b. And so in this world of, say, stochastic channels, they're sometimes called, we can often think of these things as saying, given a point in a, give me, uh, I sort of obtain a belief about b things. And a lot of scientific models seem to be written in this form. They sort of say, OK, I've got a way of sort of generating some predictions about you know, observations that might be made, given some belief about what the, what the state of the world is. And so we have one of these channels, but sometimes we also have some you know, state of A, which is sometimes called like a prior distribution, which says, oh, this is like how I believe the state of the world to be right now. And these things, you know, these, these classic categories of this D monad, these categories of stochastic channels, they, you know, they come with a tensor product that you can draw sti string diagrams, and people often draw string diagrams like this. Say this is C, and this is pi. And this says, OK, well, I've got some joint distribution over A and B, which says both my beliefs about what the state of the world is and the beliefs about the sort of data I might observe. But kind of written like this, it's like, I don't know, this is like this, this diagram with two wires A and B next to each other really says I've got a state on A times B. And of course, one thing I can do is I can say, OK, well, I throw away this A data 
or at, rather, I throw, I throw away this B data. OK, and I get back by erasing or deleting, I get my, back my sort of state on A. So that's, that throwing away thing is just the projection out of the product. OK, and because you know, I did this thing where I had a function or something like a function, and I drew it like this, this thing, this map, is really like the graph of this function c. It takes in a point in x and gives me a point, or like a fuzzy point of a y. And really, that's like, that's like, you know, this is my projection, pi a. This is like a section, if you don't mind the fact that I've, I've, I've kind of ruined the types because I've got probabilities here. But you know, if, this, if this were like a deterministic map, this would be like a section, I don't know, which is really given by the, anyway, it's just turning a function into the graph of it, which is a section of this, which is a section of this thing. And so, you know, often I want to think of scientific models as being like terms. They're like statements about how the world is, and written in this internal language of this C category. But I don't have an internal language that's not, not a very nice internal language, maybe sometimes. Um, because, say, and we'll get on to this. It doesn't have right, enough, enough limits, or it doesn't really behave like a category with an internal language somehow, somehow might do. Why is it like this power thing? Well, OK, so often in science, you know, uh, we've got like this C thing. And we often say, OK, C of A equals, I don't know, some function of A, which is deterministic. So that's just some A to B plus some like noise thing. I don't know, that's a zeta or something. And this noise thing comes with a distribution. It's like, oh, it's, it's normally distributed noise. And that's like this zeta thing, it's really like distributed. It's just really like a distribution on B. We're just adding noise. And really, a lot of scientific models are written like this. And so often, these like stochastic channels are really a times like a sample from some noise space into B, along with some point of distributions on this omega, which is the noise space. And so often, you know, these stochastic channels themselves are like parameterized maps. And you know, it, this is like this is a deterministic function now. It's like a deterministic function which, if I thought of it as like a a parameterized map. A to B, I just write this omega over it. It's just a purely formal manipulation, but now it's just a, a, a parameterized function. And it, you know, if maybe if I had enough, like if I had enough limits or you know enough structure in this para C category, I could like use my internal language to to talk about these these things, which are really like sections of types, you know. And then maybe maybe I wouldn't have to have this be a, a sort of trivial type. It could be like some more interesting kind of bundle. And you know, maybe I could talk about like how, how like the thing that I'm predicting depends on where I'm predicting from. OK. So those are my, oh, so those are two of my motivations. Two motivations. One is this thing, motivations. Oh, I don't know where to write them. Maybe I'll write them here. Motivations. One, internal language. And relatedly, uh, in language to, I don't know, stochastic models. And these, these three things are all going to be related. And the third one is, so I also often think about you know, inverting these things. So I often have like this forward thing which says, oh, I've got a prediction given some state. And then you go in the other way, say so I make some observation and I get a new state. And then th this is like some A to B thing along with a sort of B times, I don't know, some A back into A. These things, these pairs are like lenses, they're often called. Now we can write lenses in, certain, in many ways. One of them is called optics. Um, these optics 
are kind of somehow often defined using parameterizations. Now, they're defined like with some co-end. Doesn't really matter um, what that means for now. Of some thing that goes, I don't know, forwards x to m times a, and maybe some other thing that goes backwards, I don't know, m times b to y. And we've got this pair of things, one that goes forwards, one that goes backwards, and they're coupled by something. This isn't super important, but the point is that here we've got a parameterized thing, and here we've got like a co-parameterized thing. And I have these, I have some structures that are called Bayesian lenses, which allow me to go forwards by predicting and backwards by updating states. And they sort of don't fit into this pattern very well. And in particular, they don't allow me to have like this dependent structure, which I mentioned. Um, and I think these are all like symptoms of the same thing, of like not having enough like objects in those parameterizing categories. Certain people at the moment are, talking, are trying to understand something called dependent optics, which kind of maybe solves this problem of not having enough dependence. And at the moment, it's not entirely clear how the things that go predictions forwards and updates back, that are called Bayesian lenses, it's not really clear how they sort of fit into this, into this story. Um, we probably won't get as far as the kind of thing that I've been thinking of as Bayesian dependent optics today, mostly because I've already spent like 10 minutes just explaining where I'm going, but also because we're all quite tired. Um, but you know, I'm just, what I'm going to try and do is set the scene to defining these things, and maybe at some point later we can actually give the definition of them. OK. What? Oh, I've got another board. Yes. So Bayesian dependent optics. Thank you. Yes. Optics. Right. OK. So I think, first of all, it makes sense to say a little bit more about this para C thing. Um, so say I've got this category C. It's got morphisms. And say it's got products. And I want to parameterize using this product structure. So para C has objects, uh, this is zero, for objects. It has the same objects as C. And the HOM sets from A to B are going to be something like, oh, that's just, yeah, HOM set. They're going to be like pairs of a choice of parameter in C and a morphism P times a to B. And then to compose some A to B with a P and a B to C with a Q is given by you know, taking the product to the parameters. Q to like A times Q. Oh no, B times Q. Thank you. B times Q. Q. Oh, P. P times Q times. Yes, thank you. Uh, A times. Oh, P times Q times A to uh, Q times B to C. So we just, we sort of product all the parameters together at the beginning and use the one that we need in the first case, and then we've got one left over and we use the second one which was hopefully the one the right type. I said it's going to be informal. I mean, like, if you want to, if we want to be, like, the P and Q have to go in the other. Yeah, I know. OK, so it's symmetric. It's, a, it's symmetric, fine. OK. Right. So that's, that's one way of looking at this. Um, I think for na another way of looking at this is, OK, for each parameterizing objects, David, you look confused. OK? OK. I, I want this to be interactive, I think. So, well, as, I mean, I said this thing about definition theorem proof, but uh, you know, you've seen how informal this is. It's not going to be. The only thing I really I understood about why you want these parallels is the omega thing, that you want to parameterize by this omega or something. I didn't really get why what you're going for somehow, but maybe I'm just. Ah, OK. No, 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 that's fine. I can make that a little bit more clear. Um, OK. 
I'll say, I'll say. No, 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 it's an okay question. The trouble is, if we've got A, for me the trouble is, to B, which is parameterized by in P, oh, I'm going to write the parameter above, and I'm going to write the name of the morphism below, F, and I've got another one which is also parameterized by P, which I'm going to call G, then in this, in this category para C, where these are just morphisms A to B, I might want to form their equalizer. I might want to talk about their intersection. But I don't know uh, what that object would be, because the particular, say, points of A that are equalized by F and G depend on my choice of parameter P. And there's no way in this structure to give an object which has parameters. So, as I say, I feel like this para category doesn't have enough objects. That's, that's, that, that, that's this internal language motivation. And then from that, I want to be able to talk about stochastic models using my internal language and give a version of dependent ba uh, Bayesian lenses which sits into that formalism. Here. Yeah. yeah, because this comes from my sort of cognitive science kind of motivations where I say, oh, I'm a predicting thing, or I'm a thing that is trying to make sense of the world, and by doing that, I have some kind of model of how it behaves. And that means I can use that to generate a prediction or some data that I expect to receive, given some belief about you know, what way the world is configured right now, so where Evan's standing, you know, the question you just asked, um, wh what kind of angle the sun is at. And then given the, the data I do receive, I want to then update my beliefs. I want to be able to, say, form a new belief about, you know, say Evan or somebody walks around. That's the sort of data that comes in. But I need to update that, that information that I've stored in this kind of compressed representation of the world state. And so that's sort of going in the other direction from my sort of predicting morphism. Does that make sense? Okay, it's kind of... What's the P, A, and B in that example? The P, A, and B. So say the parameter is like this noise space which allows me to say, I don't know, quantify the uncertainty on like, you know, the noise coming in of the window or, you know, there's some white noise. It's maybe it hoots sometimes, I get a surprise. Um, it could be some choice of noise space. Maybe it's the same as... B, I don't know, um, but it can be quite general. The A would be the space of, I don't know, say, compressed stories I represent in my head, and then the B would be, say, the space of possible arrangements of, I don't know, firing rates of my retinal cells or something, or V1 cells, which are being somehow predicted by the higher circuits in the brain, something like that. Does that help? Okay. Right. So that's hopefully cleared up some of the motivation. And I've, I've roughly, OK, defined Q times P times A. You're right. This is much nicer. Um, yeah, it is. Um, I've roughly defined this para construction. Um, there's another way I like to think about it, which isn't quite the same, but it's like an indexed category, which, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to write as para with a wibbly thing on top. And it takes, and it's C to, maybe it's C op to cat. And it takes an object P, and it gives me a category para wibbly thing P, whose objects are objects of C. And whose homsets A to B are obviously homsets P times A to B. Ooh, why do I write it like that? But now, because this is a product, I can copy the P. So now, yeah. So now if I go, I don't know, P times A, I can go 
to p times b, because I copy the p to c. So that's how I do composition in this kind of wibbly power. It's a kind of, oh, and then I get a sort of pullback thing, which makes an index category. So given, given a morphism in c, I can sort of precompose on the parameter, and I get an index category. Each fiber over it is morphisms parameterized by p, or q, or whatever. And I can obviously do a Grotendieck thing, but that, that's the sort of formal details of this aren't super important, because I'm not actually going to use this thing. I'm going to use it as inspiration. OK. Inspiration for what? Well, the obvious thing, for, it seems to me, to do is to say, well, you know, what if instead of just the morphisms being parameterized by p or q or whatever you know, object I chose in the base category, which is here c, whatever, what if I also said that the objects were parameterized in p too? Ooh, scary. How do I do that? Well, here is where maybe it becomes a little bit sticky. Brendan, when I mentioned this before, said, oh, maybe you want to describe a, this, you know, like a model of this thing, so it's not totally abstract. Um, and there, there can be a model of this thing. What I want to do is, instead of thinking of C as just a category, and maybe it's parameterized by itself, or maybe some other category, when it's some other category, it's what people call that there's this category acting on C. It's an act degree. It's like a kind of categorification of an action. But they're all just kind of living in some world. What is that world? I don't know. I sort of want maybe if, maybe if we choose the parameters in the world, then this is maybe more faithful to what was going on here in this sort of stochastic case, right? For me, the kind of perspective I like to take on randomness is it, it's something like out there in the world that I don't know. It's kind of like an external thing which, which impinges on me. So it sort of makes sense, uh, kind of from a sort of philosophical level, to think of this parameter not necessarily as having to live in C or some s category related to C, but to live in the kind of bigger universe in which I find C and find where C is like the category that describes where I live. Okay, so how do I make all that sort of philosophy kind of more precise? The answer is, oh, I think of C as an internal category in some other category, which is, this, which is this bigger universe that lives around my world. And then the noise is stuff which impinges on C from that ambient universe of C. So, OK. Hmm. Then the question is, OK, so let's, let's write some things down. OK, I'm going to write C for my internal category. And I'm going to write E for my like ambient category. C is internal in E. C is indeed internal in E. Right. I should say what that means. What does this mean? It means that I have an object C0 in E which is the object of objects of C. I have another object, C1, OK, objects in E, which is morphisms in C. I have a couple of functions, domain, which I'm going to write sub C, and codomain sub C, which are morphisms from C1 to C0. I have another one, which I'm going to write as black dot, because it's scary, from C1 cross C0, C1 to C1, which you could guess means composition. Why is it this pullback? It's the pullback where two morphisms agree, one on the domain. I could write it, you know. So this is like. C1, C0, C1. This is code of, oh, this is, let's see. Which direction do we like to go in? Maybe, uh, maybe this is first morph. I'm going to go diagrammatic order. So left one is, so if I'm going, 
uh, g of, wait, uh, so I'm going g after f, this is going to be f goes in this left, left c1 and g goes in the right c1. Okay, so I project onto c1, project onto c1, so left, this is pi 1, project onto c1, this is pi 2, project onto c, c1. Okay, the codomain of the first morphism f and the domain of the second morphism g have to agree. So that's what this, this object is. And this is my composition morphism. And of course, there's a, an identity morphism which takes each object to its identity morphis morphism in C. And, you know, there are a load of axioms which we don't need to care about right now, but they make it into something that's like a category, right? So what's an example of this? Finite sets lives in sets. That's okay. Sets being the category of small sets and morphisms between them. Yes, Igor, please complain. <laughs> so, well, I mean... <sighs> Check my types. <laughs> it's, no, no, no. It's, it's like, I mean, the set of finite sets in like set of C, it's not actually a small set. Okay, big, okay, maybe big set then. I mean, you could say like, you know, up, up to isomorphism, this is true because, you know, true set, a model of a finite set, we only have, well, counter with many yeah. sets. Yeah. I assert it for now. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, because I know that even, even given this kind of objection, there are ways around it. And for even bigger sets than finite sets, I can make a universe which is big enough to think of that thing as living, this category living as internal to that universe. So. You're not happy with the skeleton, hmm? you're not happy with the skeleton of finite sets? That's no, that's, that's totally fine, I think. Oh, skeleton. Yeah, I mean, this is what I mean. There are ways of like, resolving this thing. I'm cho choosing finite sets as a kind of example that we can just right. latch onto, make all the skeleton of finite sets. But I'm saying that I don't think this is a problem for the general story, even in the case when they're not like finite sets. I think we can, you know, do this more generally too. Okay, right. So now we can, I'm going to go over here. Um, yeah, so now we can say, let's, let's take this Wibbly para as an inspiration for something that I'm going to call Procs. It's going to be an index category. Why is it called prox? I think of these things as proxies because, so, hmm. in a previous way of thinking about this, which I don't know, I wasn't sure, I don't know, which didn't really go as well as I have liked, I sort of thought, okay, well, what should the ambient universe idea be? It could be like the base of enrichment of a category. Well. You can make all of this para stuff work in many cases, particularly in this case where we're parameterizing by the product of a like, category on itself. You can make that work, you know, and, and say the category is Cartesian closed, you can make that work because it's then enriched in itself by thinking of instead morphisms. This could be instead of P times A to B, the morphisms could have been uh, P to internal harm A to B. And then this is enriched in itself, and so you know this is like C, P, C, A, B. And I like to think of this thing, this, this kind of map, as like giving me a way of choosing my morphisms. It's a proxy, it stands in for my choice. It's a, I say to it, Okay, I've given you this ticket, which is my parameter. You go away and choose a morphism for me. Well, the idea is going to be the same here. I'm going to say that my morphisms are going to be, instead of points of my object of morphism, they're going to be generalized elements. They're just going to be morphisms into this object of morphisms. And so similarly, my parameterized objects are going to be, obviously unsurprisingly, um, generalized elements of my object of objects. Right. And I'm going to do the same thing as I did here. I'm going to make this an index category. Right. So it's going to be. Oh, because it's short for proxy. What, what is a proxy? A pro like in voting. Like you give someone the ability to go and choose for you. So instead of making a choice of morphism, 
I, I make a choice of proxy, who then makes a choice of morphism for me. Is that, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, okay, so this is gonna be, oh, any other questions? No, good. Well, I'm sure there are many, but. I mean, yeah? so it's C, C up, should this be E? Because oh, yeah, uh, oh, hold on. Yeah, E up, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Yes, that's a very important point. Right. Okay. So now I'm going to take an. Oh, oh, yeah. And I didn't define how this worked with morphisms, but I said it was by pullback. It's going to be the same thing here. So given a pra an object P in E, the universe category, the ambient category, I'm going to get this category prox p. Its objects are going to be in E morphisms p into c0. And I'm going to write them like this is going to be, it might be called a, this, this thing. In, the, in this in the regular case, this p is 1. So like p of prox of 1 is going to be c. I think. Oh my god. I made that claim, but I actually haven't checked. Um, I, maybe later it will be c. There's at least one example of this. Because what we're, get, what we're going to do, oh man, if there's time. I said this was going to take an hour and a half. Um, what we're going to do is end up in a situation where both the objects and the morphisms can be parameterized by different objects. And the way that's going to work is I'm going to build uh, a doubly indexed category over the double category of spans. So in that case, it definitely will be the case that the one parameterized morphisms are going to be the same as C. Right. Anyway, let's get back to the this is then going to give me the fibers of that doubly indexed category. So this is why I'm defining this. Right, OK. So this is going to be the same thing. P into, well, not the same. Same, same, same domain. P into C1. Maybe call it F. Such that, well, we need, maybe I'll draw it as a diagram. Uh, P uh, C1 F and then say oop, C0 that's the domain in C and this gives me A oh no maybe yes A So that's why it's the domain. And then there's a similar one, C1, F, codomain, C0, B. Such that these two diagrams commute. OK, so that's. What is the composition going to be? So the composition is going to have the same idea as here. What we're going to do is we're going to go, so say we've got, um, say, we want to write A, B, C. It's going to be called F. This is going to be G. These are both p-indexed objects, and these are p-indexed morphisms. This is going to be given by p copy p squared. Now, these agree on B, so this lands, so this is going to be, uh, did I say F was first? So it's going to be F times G times, this lands in this pullback that I drew here, just by definition, because they agree on B, and then I can do my composition operation to get a composite morphism. 
and it's not hard to check. Oh, well, I haven't given you an identity. Identity is, that's composition. Identity says, okay, well, if I want the identity in A, it's going to be the constant map that gives me the identity, which I write that as a delta or something, identity on, no, it's going to be identity. On, it's a map that gives me identity on P. Mm. P to, yo, oh yeah, P to C uh, is going to be A to C0 to C1, that thing. Yeah, cool. There was a version where it was the constant thing, but you know it doesn't matter for now. Okay, so I think I mean you know we could prove it, but it's not. I can I can tell you that this will give me a category. We can check that it's associative. That just all really follows from the fact that C is an internal category. There's no point proving it because I didn't give you the axioms to check, but you know they will check, so that's okay. Right. So this is nice. This is nice. Okay. Now let's let's see what we can do with this thing. Maybe I'll go for, I'm allowed to go for 10 minutes, aren't I? Oh, you can go till for, for 20, 20 minutes. We started a bit late too. Okay, well I'll go for say 15. Oh, I'm really not gonna get onto Bayesian dependent optics, am I? Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, okay, whew. Okay, so this is a category. C is a category, an internal category. But the thing, I, w one thing I'm motivated Oh yeah, it's here. One thing I motivated this whole um, this whole construction with is this problem of like, what is what is an equalizer? Well, okay, let's let's try and write it down. Um, say I've got uh, I'm in prox p. I've got you know f and g. What's that? E, the, the properties on E to get equalizers, you don't need anything? No, because well, mm, I just need equalizers in C. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you need E to have like finite limits to even make sense of the notion of uh, internal category. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's kind of given because yeah, I've course, defined this, sorry, right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess you only actually need those ones to exist. You don't need any finite limit. I have this structure, yeah. and say I'm, you know, I, I'm saying, well, well, it's an equalizer in C. Well, you know, or in, in, in prox P. But if there weren't any equalizers in C, I guess it wouldn't make sense to ask the question. So, yes, there are, well, maybe you would get equalizers, but I, anyway, we've got, we've got equalizers in C. So we've got F, G, A to B. What are these really? This is, uh, we've got two things, F, P to C1, and G, P to C1. Right, so I've, I want to form their equalizer. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be, uh, yeah, eek. F, uh, G has to be an object, so that's P to C0. So say, we'll, say the universe that I'm working in, this ambient category, is, is set for now, so I can talk about points. And I'm just going to write this down element-wise. So it's going to take little p to the object, which is the equalizer in C of f, p, and g, p. This is an object that exists just you know, by hypothesis. Uh, and this is a a generalized element of C0, so it's enough to be an object of prox P. So that's an object. Does it satisfy the universal property? Okay, well I need, so say I need this, I need a map E from eek F G into A. What's that really? That's a map E from P to C1, which is given by given by taking p to this inclusion of the equalizer in A, E, P, eek, F, P, G, P, into A. Uh, uh, AP. AP, yes, thank you. 
and it's not very hard to check that this gives me equalizers. You can do the same thing with products. You get limits. Um, I think you also, if, say, Sorry, what? I have a, maybe a more, what, what does it mean for an internal category to have equalizers? Because, like, you know, you can't, I mean, so here you've written it, and I'm fine with writing things in the, like, with points mm -hmm. as a, you know, as a way of writing down definitions and proofs, but, like, you know, for, for if, if, if E isn't the category of sets, then I can't say, you know, for every, like, for every, yeah. Morphisms or set of objects in C0. You're right, C0. you're right. Um, there is a notion of limit, internal limit for an internal category. Um, I think this works there. I ha or something like this will work I, there. I, but you know, it's very plausible that if there's any definition that makes sense, then this yeah, thing will work. I so don't know if I can go through it right, right now. A, um, uh, I think it's easier just to s assume that uh, these things if are if pointed. It's than just, uh, yeah. Um, but at least in this kind of well-pointed case, right. I've got products and equalizers. When C gets products and equalizers, I also get um, exponential objects. I don't know if it's uh, that satisfy. Yeah, I want to get on to the next bit, which is the parameter, different parameters on, on codomain and domain and the morphisms. So I will just assert that in the case where you've got C being internally Cartesian closed, whatever that means, then so is prox of e each fibers prox of P is two, and I think also it will have a subobject classifier if C has a subobject classifier. So it's quite nice because it means that I do get this kind of internal language thing, which is well, I mean which is something I don't have here. Or at least I, I can, you know, start to think a bit more like toposy, which is something that we all maybe appreciate in this place. Um, right. I'm just making but assertions. It's kind of getting a little bit funny, right? But oh, yes, it is. So then you wanted noise and you wanted a tensor product. Now we can oh, true. Just Good point. Yeah, right, 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 right. So, right. Okay, but, but so, 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 so here, like, normally when we have this stochastic map thing, we've got a category of like measurable spaces or spaces that like behaves like that or some kind of spaces. It has products, right? It has products. And I can use that product structure to define a category where I also attach to the morphisms, like these distributions, say. Um, and I, I can define a category where, instead of these just sort of abstract stochastic maps, I really have like noisy morphisms, where I sort of push my noise through, forwards through the parameter. Um, that's, I think, a legitimate way of talking about m noisy things. Um, so I think, I think using like products and not tensor products isn't too too problematic. At least we can go we can go through it. Um, but yes, you're right that there's none of that uh, noise stuff here. But that's because all I'm doing at this point is defining the fibers of my doubly index category. Um, it's in the horizontal morphisms that I'm going to get the noise. So really, what I'm not going to be using is span as my base, ca base double category, but um, decorated spans. And I'm going to decorate the spans by, or I could choose to decorate the spans by distributions. Um, and as I said, it's the horizontal morphisms here, which are going to be decorated with, which are going to be given this noise structure which comes from these decorations. So that, I think, will be OK. We'll get the thing that I wanted. Right. So uh, I'm going to now talk maybe for five or so more minutes. Maybe, I don't know, we'll see, maybe 10. Um, to so try and get towards at least a definition of that thing, um, which I'm going to just write as prox with a sort of double bar thing to show it's going to be a double kind of object is going to be from f span. And I think I need it to be op in the sort of vertical category. And it's going to land in the double category of categories 
functors and profunctors. Right. So to get there, we need to know what f span is. So that's fun. Um, Brendan, do you want to tell me what f span is? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I, I will tell you about decorated spans. So, kind of, so last time we had a prox, it was secretly like prox subscript C. Like is this prox? Is, ah. prox, is this still like a? This is going to be prox subscript C. Okay. Uh, I haven't actually thought about the morphisms that are induced on these things by functors on inter like internal like func internal functors. I, d I don't know. That will be fun. But like there is still a C here. Like yeah. Still yeah. Good cool. Goodness. Right. So okay. So we need to think about f span, which means we think of, need to think about span. So let's say, what is this double category of spans? Okay. Well, a span is. Hmm, I'm now going to switch to writing my parameters with Greek le capital letters because I'm going to run out of letters quite soon. So a span from omega to gamma is going to be like two morphisms, which I'm going to call the legs, and I won't, this, which I'm going to call the apex, which is lambda. I'm going to write this as Maybe it could be called f, but the left one I'm going to call f0, the right one I'm going to call f1. These are going to be the horizontal morphisms in <laughs> span, and then in f span with some other data. So what are omega and gamma? Like they the are omega? just, sorry, yes, you're right, they're spanned in E. Right, yes, good question. Horizontal morph. Oh, so I've got. I've given you my objects of f of span. I'm going to give. I've given you my horizontal morphisms. I'm going to give you the vertical morphisms. They're just going to be morphisms in E. So to omega prime. So gamma prime. And you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to give you a square or a two cell. Is going to be a morphism, say phi on the apexes, apices, that makes a diagram, or maybe let's call that f, f, f prime zero, f prime one, that makes, I, I write my ones the French way, that makes this kind of diagram commute, right? So this is a, we can, we can, we can check, well, yeah. So vertical composition is just composition in E. Um, the horizontal composition, so say we've got, I don't know, Gamma, O, and, I don't know, eta into, say, delta. This is going to be G0, G1. I need to make, I'm not going to erase my two cell. I need to make A span, which is going to be omega. Oh, oh maybe I'll just move all this down. It's the obvious thing that people know about. Lambda, gamma, eta, delta, f0, f1, g0, g1. Do the pullback. E, I seem to have pullbacks. Eigel's right. I don't need to have all pullbacks just to define this. I'm now going to say it has pullbacks. Lambda and gamma, like this. This is my composite span. Nice, right, horizontal composition, vertical composition, two cell composition, just, just vertical composition, double category. Right, cool. Now, I said I wanted to decorate these things with some noise, so I'm going to mm, erase my board over here. OK, I'm going to define, I'm gonna, well, the noise is going give, to be given by a functor from E op into posets. Uh, no, I'm not going to get into the poset structure, into sets. 
is going to take an object gamma to... Now I'm going to assume, and please don't yell at me, I'm just going to assume that I can attach to my objects in E distributions, finitely supported probability distributions on those objects. And I'm going to write that thing as the thing I wrote before. It's going to be give, that's given by this D monad, D E to E. I'm just going to take distrib distrib distributions on omega. I saw a lot of frowning when I wrote E there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. And then, oh, oh, yeah, it's like given. This is a set. Yeah. That's an object. This is a, this is a set. Yeah, I know it's OK, E. Doesn't matter. And then it's not the same as D. It's going to act by, given a morphism, uh, maybe phi again from omega prime to omega. It just takes that to the thing that works by pullback. So it takes F of omega to F of omega prime by, by pullback. Is that okay? Question, if you want that to be sort of post-set for the codomain, which I prefer as a codomain, uh, yeah, do know. you want it to be internal post-sets in E? Maybe. So distribution is not So what was my post-set structure going to be? I can't remember. I can check, but I can't remember. Um, it is important in some way for making the whole thing work, but not for giving. I mean, I can, I can make this thing work, but I'm just going to give you, I, I've, only, I'm, I've got like three minutes. OK, so right, I've given you, OK, and then, oh, oh man, how am I going to define composition? So the vertical composition is going to just be given by Mm. You know what? Let's just forget the Fs for now. It's easier because I'm going to run out of time and I might as well just recapitulate this part where it didn't have the randomness. I can tell you that it will work with randomness too, but maybe another day. Right, so okay. So on each object, remember the objects of span are just objects of E, I'm going to give you a category. That category is going to be prox of that object. So prox C of, I don't know, omega is just going to be prox omega. Given a vertical morphism, I need to get a functor, so given some, I don't know, uh, alpha from omega to omega prime, I get prox alpha, which I already said it's opposite in the vertical direction, so it goes from prox omega prime to prox omega, and as I said before, it's just this, the action of this prox index category, it's by pullback. The, the sort of slightly more interesting question is, what do I do on the horizontal morphisms? And that is, I give you a profunctor. So I need to say, what is prox of uh, what do I say? C. Omega F0 at lambda F1 into gamma. This needs to be a profunctor. And it's going to be given by this thing, prox C omega times op times prox gamma into set and this says and it says give given an I'm going to define it on objects first so given an a omega to c0 and b gamma to c0 
I give you a set. I give you a set of morphisms f lambda into C1 such that uh, and I'm going to draw diagrams lambda C1 that's going to be f this is f0 so omega I've got a C0 and domain and lambda C1 gamma that's f1 that's B, C0, that's codomain, such that both of these diagrams commute. And this says that these things behave like morphisms from A to B. Now, on co so, the so the vertical composition, okay, right, and then And then I'm going to be able to like, do a double Gurdon deconstruction. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to have any time left, so I'm not going to tell you about how that works in any detail, except to say that it's like the Gurdon deconstruction horizontally. I think I learned, from, learned about this from David Jazz Myers. So it's like vertically, it's like the, the Gurdon deconstruction, so I get objects being, the objects are going to be, I get a double category. The objects are going to be pairs of an object like an object in, so say I've got omega in my sort of E, in my ambient category, so the objects are going to be pairs of an omega and an object of prox omega. And I'm going to write it like that, A omega, which tells me m my parameters on A are given by omega. The vertical morphisms are going to be pairs of a morphism in E and a, like a morphism in the standard Grotendieck way that makes the whole thing work. Just look up the Grotendieck construction. The horizontal morphisms are going to be given by a span. I'm going to write f lambda. So this is going to go from a omega to b gamma. The this kind of horizontal morphism in my double Grotendieck category is going to be given by a span, like before, from uh, omega f0 f1 to gamma and an element of this profile of this set for for this span given by this profile functor so it's going to be an element like f from lambda to c1 such that these two diagrams commute. And these things will compose on the spans by span composition, horizontal composition, and on the, the parameterized morphisms, the proxies, by, well, how does this work? I've got this thing. This thing will be the apex of my new span, having done the span composition horizontally. So I'm going to need to have some, say I've got f lambda, ooh, lambda to c1 here, and g eta to c1 here. Well, I'll get g f from lambda cross eta, oh, cross, oops, gamma eta into c1 which just gives me, given a lambda and an eta, I get uh, g eta after f lambda composed in the internal category. And so this, this gives me a, an index double category. I can take this double Grotten deconstruction the fibers are all, if say C are like topoi, then so are the fibers. And given enough quotienting, which is something I have not mentioned at all, I can make a one category out of this thing that also has the nice properties I wanted, where the morphisms are something like um, horizontal morphisms quotiented by the existence, like, like a sort of co-endy thing quotiented by the existence of some two cell. But really, 
I'm doing this quotient thing because I don't know what a double category version of, say, a topos is. I don't really know what a double limit is like. I have, I, that's all stuff I can check. But even if I do this kind of nasty quotient thing, I get some kind of uh, structure, which is the stuff I like. And that, yeah, and as I mentioned, I can also do this thing, which I didn't mention, at, didn't describe at all, where I attach like distributions to the apices, and then I can sort of push all those forwards too. Thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.